and we do the best that we can to teach the heart of Jesus Christ. And, and that's why this is a house of love and, if you will, a house of prayer. And that's what I'll be speaking to you about this morning is prayer. And it will be the conclusion of something that was started by Pastor Rob and, and Pastor Oates added to it. I spoke to a little bit last week and then I'll be finishing it up this week. And that is the Gospels Talk. And we've been looking at various aspects of the teachings of Jesus as it relates to our lives. So I want to talk to you about prayer because I believe more than anyone in the scripture, Jesus teaches on prayer. But just before I go into that, I'd like to just bow our heads together. I'd like to bow my head if you'll join me. And we're just going to pray and ask God to bless our time together. So would you bow your heads with me, Father? We are grateful to be here this morning. We believe the word of God. We believe it even when the world doesn't. We approach you by faith this morning, knowing that we need you even today. Even after we've accepted you, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior, we need you every day, every day of our lives. We need a fresh, a fresh anointing, a fresh pouring out of the Spirit in our lives. So God, today... We come to you with eyes open and ears open and, and, and the word open. And we're ready to receive in our hearts the truth that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Last week, I finished out our time by talking to you about a verse in the Bible that I found quite astonishing, quite, quite uh, really um, uh, compelling, if you will. And, it, and it's not actually found in the Gospels, although that's what this series is all about. It talks about Jesus, who, who his life is portrayed in the Gospels. But this actually comes out of Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 7. So let me read it to you and then tell you why I find it so incredibly uh, wonderful and astonishing. It says, uh, and, and this verse is really written about Jesus. And it says this, Who, in the days of his flesh... When he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Why is that astonishing? It's astonishing because the scripture does not say that Jesus was heard by the Father because he was the Son of God. Because he was the everlasting to everlasting. Because he is the soon and coming King of kings and Lord of lords. And all those things are true. But we find in Hebrews 5, 7, the Bible telling us he was heard because he was reverent. He was reverent. That's compelling to me because... That means then if I am reverent, if my life then is reverent to the Father because I, I know I, I have items in my life that I'm praying for that, that can't be fixed in the flesh, that, that, that can't, it's going to require God-sized answers for these mountains to be moved. Do you, do you have any of those in your life where, where it just requires something beyond you? Well, the hope and the opportunity and the astonishing thing about Hebrews 5, 7 says, if you and I will become reverent to the Father in our lives, meaning that we're obeying the Father's will, we're patterning our, patterning our life after the Word of God, then we have the opportunity to have God-sized answers, the same kind of answers that Jesus had to his prayers. We could have them in our lives. And it doesn't matter if we're the Son of God or not. It matters our reverence to the Father. See, that excites me. Because I want to see, not only do I need, but I want to see God do things in, in, the, in the sphere of my eyesight and in the influence I have in my life. I want to see God do things that no man can. Because then I can point to it and say, God did that. And nobody can push back and say, oh no, that was coincidence or that was, oh no, no, no. That's God. I need that. I need that. Do you need that? Well, that's why we're doing this little this little uh, talk on prayer. Last week, as I shared with you, those of you who were here, what I compelled you to do, what I encouraged you, almost begged you to do, was have time alone with God. 
get into a habit of spending time with him. And, and, and what I said to you was, I don't want to preach to you. And that was last week. This is this week. That was last week. All right. I didn't want to, I didn't want to talk to you about form and function of what that prayer is supposed to look like. I wanted to impress upon you the drawl of the Holy Spirit to take you into a time with the Lord every single day where you're talking with him and you're listening to him talk with you. Now, some of you actually came to me and said, I did that. And I was so thrilled to hear you tell me about that, how, how you had begun that and you told me about different places where you were sitting and listening to the Lord and you had your cup of coffee in the morning. So it doesn't matter if it's morning, doesn't matter if it's afternoon, doesn't matter if it's nighttime. God's made all of us different. But the thing is, we've got to get away in our time with the Lord. We've got to get away and be with him. That was the crux of last week. Now, this week we're going to talk about form and function. But I don't want you to hear it apart from the message last week. I want you to hear that form and function will only work, it'll only uh, reveal the fruit that God wants it to if it's on the foundation of the relational draw to that time with the Lord. So are we copacetic with that? We, we good with that? All right, now let's talk about it. Because Jesus, in, the, in the, the Gospels, he actually offers a clinic, a workshop. Have you ever been to a seminar before or a conference? Okay, Jesus offers a conference on the topic of prayer, which is found inside of the relational draw for you being away with the Lord daily and praying. So, so I want to talk about some of the items that we see. And, and uh, the first is going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. Now, it's interesting. Oh, I'll just go ahead and read it, and then I'll tell you what's interesting about it. It says this, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So what we find in this first section that I want to talk about real briefly, we find do nots. Now I didn't say donuts, all right? You're, you're thinking donuts. It's getting close to lunch. I know that. But, but, uh, so, but if it helps you to think of donuts, that's fine. Think of donuts, but they're actually do nots. There's two do nots that I want to talk about, all right? And the first one is this. Jesus is saying, do not pray to gain approval and admiration from other people. In other words, when you're praying, don't pray so that other people will hear you. Don't, don't pray so that other people will pat you on the back. And some of us, we've got these really amazing styles in how we pray. And some of you have got pizzazz when you pray and people like to listen to you pray. That's all good. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have style and you shouldn't have pizzazz, whether that's being loud or sounding like God when you pray. I mean, there's, there's all different kinds of ways that people pray, and it's all good, except when we cross the line over and we're doing it so that people hear us. Now, I pray in front of you, and I'm hoping that you're hearing me because we're praying in agreement together for a service but the, or for those kinds of things. But as I'm praying, and hopefully as you pray too, you're not praying for the purpose of being heard by man. You're praying for the purpose of being heard by God. Does that make sense? So that's what Jesus is saying. Don't pray to get the admiration. Don't put yourself in positions so that other people hear you for the sake of you. Versus the sake of the Lord God being glorified and uplifted. The second do not that Jesus refers to here is, is do not pray with your spirit and your brain disengaged. God wants your brain and your spirit engaged. For instance... Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. This is a really bad day. I'm doing it four times. Jesus, I love you. Really bad. Five times. Jesus, I love you. Amen. And off to work I go. 
Now, does Jesus like it when you say, I love you? Yes, but that's a mantra. That's, a, that, that's, that's just vain repetition. It, it has no bearing. God heard you the first time, all right? He, he heard you. That's enough. What Jesus is saying is be careful about disengaging your brain and disengaging your spirit. Now, there are times in prayer where, especially on Tuesday mornings, as we are lifting you up as a staff, we, we have a piece of paper that has every single prayer request put on that piece of paper. And then many of us, I do this, I, I have a pen and I'm checking as I go down the list to make sure not one person is missed in the prayers that you submit. Sometimes we have three and four pages of prayer requests. It's pretty extensive. Sometimes we're there for an hour to an hour and a half praying for you. Now, we're certainly using our minds during that time because we're, we're reading these requests and we're praying for them. And there's other times where, where our minds begin to come down and my eyes are closed and I'm just in the presence of the Lord and I'm worshiping God and, and it's a sweet, powerful time. So, so our minds and our spirits, they're kind of ebbing and flowing a little bit. One's used more than the other at, at various times in prayer. But what the, what the Lord is saying is don't disengage your brain and your spirit from prayer. Don't just go into mindless babbling that makes no sense. Unless, of course, you're using one of the, the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit offers. That's a, that's a whole different issue altogether. But to, to, to just go on without any, without any uh, inkling of what you feel like the Spirit is leading you to pray for or the very topic that's on your mind, that, that, that is not at all what the Lord wants. So the command to avoid babbling is a reminder that God does not need our information. I, I recall out of the Old Testament, there was a, a prophet who was standing before. He was standing alone in front of armies, in front of, of evil men and women, in front of, in front of the people of Israel who were obstinate, obstinate against God, and a king and a queen who also wanted him dead. So he's standing there alone, right? And you think of all the times to have a long prayer to cover every one of the T's or cross the T's and dot the I's to make sure it's perfect. He doesn't do that at all. He offers this very short, succinct prayer and then fire comes out of heaven as a result of his prayer. Listen to this prayer. 1 Kings 18. O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Boom! Fire from heaven. So it was not a long, drawn-out prayer. He used his mind. The Holy Spirit was involved in that. And God did a mighty thing. So those, those amazing things in your life that you look at going, how in the world is that going to get accomplished? It's not the length of your prayers or the endless babbling or the disengaging of your brain that will bring them about. We pray like the prophets of old. We pray like Jesus told us to pray and we don't, we don't disengage from them. We're actively involved in them. Now, Jesus told them, the path that prayer ought to take. So we're now finished talking about the do nots. For those of you who might be hungry, the donuts. Okay, we're not talking about the donuts anymore. Now we're going to talk about what to do. And here's where, here's where the clinic, the, the, the workshop really begins because Jesus introduces to his listeners the model prayer. And inside the model prayer, uh, let me read this and then let me break it down for you. And by the way, if you'd like to read this with me out loud, feel, so, feel free to do so. This may come out of your roots in the kind of churches that you've been to in the past. So it's Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us 
from evil. Now, as I said, this is the model prayer. But what's really interesting about the model prayer is the model prayer has two sections, two different areas of emphasis that Jesus teaches us to pray for. And inside those two emphasis, each has three different topics. And just briefly, I want to go into those with you because I really want to see this begin to take root in your time when you commune with the Father, that time when you go away. And honestly, you can do this in seven to ten minutes. What I'm describing to you, you can do this in seven to ten minutes a day. Now, as you get into it, you're going to want to expand that, but it's a great starting place uh, at five, seven, ten minutes. So we have six petitions, right? The first three deal with God's nature and his purpose, which is the best place to start when you're praying. Here's what it says. Hallowed be thy name. We pray on behalf of the holiness of God. Now, sometimes I, I hear people in their prayers there, and it's all good, um, they're, they're praying and they're, they're using words that they've experienced in their life that may not have much to do with the Bible. I've heard people reference God as Big Daddy. Now, I haven't found Big Daddy in Scripture, but you know what? That's theologically sound, all right? But, but um, I, I want to suggest to you that the, 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 the most powerful, the most poignant prayers that you can offer to the Lord would be words that are actually found in Scripture, like... The eternal one, king and lord, king of kings, lord of lords. These, these, are, these are phrases that scripture has in it that are of God. Now, I know when my girls come to me and, and you know, they, 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 they can uh, say dad, daddy, father, whatever. It's fine and it gets my attention. It gets my attention. But I can also tell by the tone of their voice, even how they say my name, at the condition of their heart and maybe what they want, whether it's serious or funny or whatever the case may be. But see, when you begin to choose the, the words of God found in Scripture, the same thing happens. God's beginning to hear the condition of your heart. So I want to encourage you in your alone time with the Lord, um, and, and if, if you need some guidelines, go to the book of Psalms, because in there you will find many different names that David uses and other writers of Psalm uses, use to, to identify God and call him uh, his, his name. So, so I want to encourage you to do that. Now, we go, we go on from there, from hallowed be thy name, um, to, to uh, an urgency, a call now to his leadership. Hallowed be thy name. And then right after that is thy kingdom come. Say that with me. Thy kingdom come. And see what that is, is it's a call to the urgency of the leadership of God in our lives. And that's how our prayers ought to be founded. God, I need your leadership in my life. Uh, let me offer a little parenthesis here. This next series that I'm doing on the end times, I'm calling it thy kingdom come. Why am I calling it that? Because I want the entire series and even the teaching that I'll be doing on the Thursdays after the Sunday. So that means this Thursday there isn't a class. It's going to be next Thursday after the first sermon, right? So I want all of the classes, I want all of the sermons, Lord willing, to be a prayer. It's a platform of faith and it's a platform of prayer. In all of the things that we talk about, God, we're crying out to you. We're looking at these things and our heart's cry is, God, thy kingdom come. We just want you to come back as soon as possible. That's why that's there. So, uh, and by the way, if you are going to be coming to the classes please sign up ahead of time because we have well over 100 people that are already signed up and, and we'll have material for you, but it may not get to you for a week or two because of the number of people that we'll have to make copies for who show up without signing up. So, so we want you to have material. So if you could do us a favor as well as for the child care sake, we want you to sign up online. That way we can get a good head count and we'll have everything prepared for you when you get here. We're going, to be, we're going to be looking at many different things. Is Jesus really coming back? Or is that all just hoopla? What's going on in our world right now? What role does the United States have? What, what, what's happening in Israel? What's the difference between the, the agenda that God has with Israel and the agenda that God has with 
uh, the church today. What's going to happen to the church? What's going to happen to Israel? We're going to look at many different things, and, and, and we'll be looking at the blood moons. Is this a bunch of hoopla? Is it just a bunch of men making money? Or is there significance to what everybody's talking about on the prophetic scene right now, the blood moons? Did we indeed just see the star of Bethlehem in the month of June in Israel? And if so, was that possibly the first time it showed up in 2,000 years? Is that significant? We're going to be looking at many things. So if you're, and I, I won't be covering a lot of that on Sunday mornings. A lot of that will be broken out on Thursday evenings. Sunday mornings, is, that's going to be general, pointed, overarching principles that will help us, kind of salt us for what's going to be happening on Thursday night. So make plans to be there on Thursday night, all right? So let me get back into the message on prayer right now. So we have, we have Jesus teaching um, uh, two different segments. Uh, in other words, he, he, he starts by teaching us about prayer in regard to him and the nature of God and then petitions by the petitioner for what they need in their life. So we pray for the urgency of his leadership. And as far as that, let me read to you Paul's attitude toward the urgency of Christ's leadership. In 2 Timothy 4, 8, Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We see right here that Paul loves the appearing of Jesus, not in his day-to-day -day life. Okay, he, he had one of those, and that rocked his world. All right? So I, I'm sure he's content with his relationship with Jesus by faith. But understand this. He loves the idea that soon Jesus is coming back and Jesus is going to set up his kingdom. And we ought to live our lives that way as well. As a matter of fact, that's a, that's a whole doctrine. It's a discipline. The early church lived and breathed with the anticipation of Jesus coming back. It shaped how they lived, as a matter of fact. And it ought to shape how you and I live our lives today as well. This next is this, that, that, we, that we would pray for the accomplishment of God's purpose in our life. You might not think that that's very important, but I want to suggest to you this is critical to our lives. Here's what is said. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In my, in my time with the Lord, which again, let me add this caveat to you. I'm, I'm referencing myself not because I am an expert. I'm referencing myself because this is how I'm trying to grow in my prayer life, in my one-on-one in my -on -one time with the Lord. So in that time as I'm communing with the Father, I'm asking that the Lord's will be done. And it may sound like, Father, I just pray that your will would be done in Karen's life. Karen's my wife. I pray that your will would be done in Abigail and Morgan and Sierra. I pray that your will. And, and I have all these requests that I'm praying for, for each of these people, for the staff, for the elders, for you. I'm praying for these things. But, but at the end of it, I'm saying, Father, I know what I want. I think I know what you want. But ultimately, I want to see your will done. And you might be thinking, why do you do that? I mean... Really, what's the point of prayer anyway? I mean, God's just going to do what he wants to do. Why, why spend all that time praying? And I want to suggest to you it's critical that you pray this way. It's critical to your faith that constantly in your time alone with God, you're saying, God, we, I, I do need a job right now, God. I can't imagine how I'm going to pay the bills next month. And, but God, God, I want your will done. Not my will. And God, my family member is ill and it looks like this person is going to pass away. I can't imagine you wouldn't want them healed. But ultimately, God, I want your will to be done. And you're thinking, well, that's crazy. Why, why, why even pray? Because God's just going to do what he wants to do. But I want to take you back to the heart of Jesus. If anybody had the freedom and the right to do what he wanted to do on this earth, would it not be Jesus? But let me take you to one of the most heavy and pointed and pivotal times in the life of Jesus and listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 26. Jesus is in the garden and he says, My father, he's praying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Now notice 
this next sentence. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. If, if it is important to Jesus at this time in his life to come up underneath the authority of the Father, the will of the Father, how much more then do you think it is important for you too to come up underneath the authority of the Father and the will of the Father? Now let me talk straight for just a moment. Oftentimes, most of the time, when we choose not to pray, it is because, listen, you're in rebellion to the Father. In other words, what that means is, I know the Father has a will. He has a plan for my life. And if I pray, ultimately that prayer is going to lead me to the place where I'm surrendering to his will. That's what the Holy Spirit will continue to bring to me. He identifies in love and in tenderness those places in my life that are coming up against the will of God. So in prayer, those places are being weeded out by the Holy Spirit. I don't want that. I want my own will. So I can't pray. So I'm going to operate in tandem with God. I love God. I want his purposes in my life. So, so God, I know you've got your stuff going on, and I'm right over here going parallel with you. And you might think that's parallel, but I'm telling you, it's rebellion. It's rebellion against his will. You see, every aspect of your life, Christian, listen to me, every aspect of your life, you ought to be able to, in prayer, go to the Lord and say, Lord, here is what I want. But ultimately... Thy will be done. Say that with me, just that phrase. Thy will be done. That's right. So we must be careful about an attitude that would well up inside of us that says, I don't need to pray. It doesn't matter anyway. Go deeper and check the motive, check the attitude behind that because it very well may be a heart that says, I really just want to do what I want to do, and I'm not interested in God speaking into that. All right? Did I step on your toes enough there? Okay, good. All right, let me, let me go on to the second group of petitions, if you will, that we, that we find Jesus teaching in his prayer workshop. And the second group of petitions are for the needs of the petitioner. And, and the first one is this, for sustenance. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, when I was studying this, do you know what jumped off the page at me? The word that jumped off the page? It was the word daily. Give us this day our daily bread. So I scratched my head going, you know what? I think what Jesus is communicating here is that these prayers ought to be, say the word, daily. daily. Jesus isn't praying for the food he ate yesterday, and he's not praying for the food that he was going to eat tomorrow. He was praying for what? What he had that day. We're asking you, God, for food today, which means that we've got to be in the habit of getting away with the Father. What's the word? Daily. Daily. Jesus is saying, I want you to be communing with the Father daily. Now, again, it doesn't have to be forever. It doesn't have to take up four hours of your day. But it needs to start somewhere where you're communing with the Father. And again, I'm not addressing form and function. you got to do this and check it off your list. There's places for that, but not in your relationship with the Father. In your relationship with the Father, what I want to see is you drawn there where your heart is open. And, and, and in the morning or afternoon or evening, whenever works for you, you're going, I just feel, I feel the draw of the Father to just go sit and be with Him. And then once you're there, you can start the form and the function of, of that prayer time. So we pray daily for sustenance, but we connect with the Father daily as well. The second thing we see, which is really beautiful, is for the restoration of fellowship with God through forgiveness that leads to a healthy lifestyle. Here's the phrase out of the model prayer. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do you guys, those of you who were here at the beginning of the year, do you remember me teaching you about the four R's? Repent, receive, resist, and replace. 
Well, that is a very big part of my personal walk with, with the Lord in the morning time. I, I, and, and some of it, I wish it wasn't so, but I'm human and, and, and I fall and we all do, we all sin. So in the morning time, one of the very first things that I do is repent. I repent, Lord, yesterday. You brought conviction into my life about this and this and this and this and this and this. You know, you, Lord, you've spoken into my heart, so I just want to say now that I repent of these things. And I ask you to forgive me of these sins that I've committed yesterday, whether it's fear or pride or whatever the case may be. Maybe I was insensitive to my wife or children, whatever. I bring those to the Lord, and it's important that I do so. I'll explain that a little bit more in just a moment. So the next... The next thing that I do is I receive. I don't just stop there and go on with my day. I then sit in that chair or whether I'm on my knees and I will say, Father, I receive your mercy and your grace right now. I receive love. I receive acceptance from you. And, and it's, it's like drinking cold water on a hot day. I just feel, I experience then the Father ministering to me as he promises to do through the Holy Spirit and through his angels. But I don't stop there. It's not enough. I then move to the place where I resist, based upon James 4, 17, where it says, Submit yourselves then to the Lord, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And I will take time in the morning, and I will look and identify the places where I see the devil, and he's waiting to just get his talons into my life and get me in a stronghold where I'm continuing to operate in that in a selfish way, in a self-centered way, and I'm not able to, to live the life that God God wants me to live. And that may, that may cause you to go, really? For real? I'm like, absolutely. Now, I don't start with resisting the devil. Do you know why I don't start resisting the devil? And he would like me to do that. Because when I start with resisting the devil, what I'm really saying is, devil, you made me do all this, so I just need to get you out of here, and then I will be fine. But the fact of the matter is, the devil's a camper. He's a squatter. He only comes into territory that's prepared for him. And I made that decision. I'm the one who sinned. I'm the one who set the stage for him. And he walks in because he has right to do so. But as soon as I repent, as soon as I say, God, would you forgive me, the legal rights for him to come in and set up residence in my life is gone. And then and only then can I resist him. And that's why James said, you submit yourselves then to the Lord. That's the repentance. He has to leave. He has to flee. But if I'm just saying, oh, devil, you get out of here. Oh, devil, you're, you're messing with me again. And whenever I see the devil continuing to tap at parts of my life, I want to be quick to go back and say, God, is there something that's giving him the right to do those things in my life? And more times than not, I will see that there's some choices that I've made, attitudes that I'm carrying, emotions that I'm living out of that aren't healthy, and I'm quick to try, I'm quick to say, God, would you forgive me? I receive now. Devil, get out of here. And I don't do it silently because it, I don't believe that the devil can read my mind. I don't. I think the devil reads our faces. He reads our circumstances. He puts thoughts in there. But when I tell him to flee, I believe I need to do that out loud. And I want to encourage you to do that as well. But we're not done there because we get to the fourth R. The fourth R is I replace. So after I've kicked the devil out, which is... After I have accepted God's forgiveness and his, his love and his mercy, which is after I have repented, then I ask God, God, would you replace? So if I've been walking in fear and I've confessed that sin to the Lord, then what I'll do is I'll go back and say, God, I believe what you've said in the, in the scripture, that perfect love casts out fear. So I take those old lies out and I put truth in its place and I will operate in perfect love today. The love that Jesus Christ that drove him to the cross drives me to live for him today. So I replace those things. Guys, in your time with the Lord, grab hold of those four R's. And watch what happens, because even in that, you are reverencing the Lord. And you will find great things happen in your prayer life. And then the last thing here, in, in light of the, the prayer life, the, the, the clinic that Jesus is offering on the model prayer, it says this, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us 
from evil. And that's the maintenance of our fellowship, our protection. protection. So we're constantly in a, in a mode of prayer with the Lord where we're asking him to build us and grow us so that we don't fall into temptation. Now, what I'd like to do for a moment is leave the whole model prayer and, and I want to suggest to you that there's a, there's a passage in the Bible where Jesus prays, where he, he, he alludes to prayer, and he, he speaks about the idea of us being together. Everything that I've been sharing with you up to this point has been with you alone with the Lord. I want to turn a corner and say that that's not the only kind of prayer that God wants you to be involved in. He wants you to be involved in corporate prayer. Listen to what he says. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. You see, to God, the idea of unity and oneness and agreement is critical. As a matter of fact, let me read to you another verse that we find in Scripture, and it's Revelation chapter 22. It's at the very end of Scripture. There's this phrase the Spirit and the bride say, Come. What does that mean? It means that the Spirit and the bride are one. You go all the way to the beginning of Scripture and you find Adam and Eve in the garden, and God is blessed because of the unity. They were physically naked. They were spiritually naked. They were relationally naked, but they were unified together. A man should leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and become one flesh. God loves agreement, and he loves unity. And therefore, God wants us to be unified in prayer. Unity is essential. South Bay Church, when, when um, you heard Pastor Rob up here a little while ago when he was talking about South Bay, saying this is a church of prayer, that's, if you're visiting with us, that's something that you're going to hear. But we don't say that to try to brand South Bay or label South Bay. South Bay Church, we really want to be known as a church of prayer, but it's because we believe in prayer, not because it's the right thing. And I want you to think about with me you engaging some of our corporate prayer times. This morning, around 6.30, when, when we were starting to pray, the Lord just impressed upon my heart to ask this group of men, and, and we had a gal there this morning too, and women, you're completely and totally invited to come to that time. But we meet right here at about 6.30. There's, I didn't count between 17 and 23 people here this morning. We're praying for you. We're praying for our world. We're praying that the Lord's word would go forth. We're praying for the worship. We're praying for all kinds of things. But at the end of the prayer time, I asked, I said, men, how many of you would say that this prayer time right here at 6.30, and we have other prayer times that are rocking, just like this one is, right? But I, I, I'm involved in this one. So I said, man, how many of you would say that this particular prayer time at 6.30 on Sunday morning has changed your life, really changed your life? And every one of these men lifted up their hand, as did I. We have prayer meetings all throughout the week. And I want you to prayerfully consider becoming a part of those. And you don't, you're not going to be put on the spot. You're not going to be forced to pray. But I do believe that if, if you will get connected in that, you are going to see God do mighty things. Now listen, I shared something with you last week. And, and I believe it to be true. And I want to share it again with you this week. And that is this. You look out across the scope of our society and our culture. And if you're not alarmed, then you're not looking, okay? I said this last week. Those individuals, those families, and those churches that are praying are going to survive. Those individuals and those churches and those families that are not praying together, mark my word, are not going to survive. God has painstakingly established a prayer movement inside of this house, as well as various places where you can plug in. 
because he was setting the stage for his provision as we move out into our end times. And I want to invite you to come and be a part of that corporately. Nobody's going to ask you to pray out loud. You might want to, but listen, friend, God can change the United States of America whether there may be no one who stands up to declare what is right. God can still change this country and put it back to what it was designed to be. And I base that on something God promised in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, and by the way, that's you and me, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and what? Pray. God's calling the church to pray. So we have venues and avenues for that to happen. I'm asking you to come and join in prayer. The last thing that I want to say to you this morning before we dismiss is this. The, the, the most powerful prayer, the greatest prayer that you could ever pray is not the model prayer. It's the sinner's prayer. I come in contact with people from time to time and, and they tell me about different times in their life where they've called out to God and, and seemingly he answered them, but they're not Christians. They're not. They're professed not Christians, but they call out to God. And, and, and I want to tell them, and I want to tell you if you've done that, that, that until a person puts Jesus Christ on the throne of their heart, God does not hear you. As loud as you may cry, he cannot. So as much as you love your children or love your spouse or love your neighbors and you want them to, to be good or get out of dead or, or be healed or whatever, until Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, the Lord cannot hear you. That's why the sinner's prayer is so critical in your life. You see, the scripture teaches us this, that Jesus Christ is our mediator. That when we pray, Jesus takes our prayers and he presents them to the Father. And the only way that's possible is if Jesus indeed is your mediator. The way to open that door is to pray the sinner's prayer. And that is to say, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that I am a sinner and that I can be saved by faith. So Jesus, I put my faith and trust in you today. The moment that you do that, and the moment that you start that relationship with the Father, Jesus at that moment becomes your mediator. He's the communicator. And he takes the prayers that you pray, and he presents them to the Father deeper, more powerful, more potent, and then and only then you will see. Now listen, there are times when you cry out to God, when you slip and you're sliding off the road and you go, God, and you're, you're not a believer. God, put the, put the car back on the road. And the car may be put back on the road, but I assure you it's not because of your prayer. It's because the Father's given you another chance to find Him through Jesus. This morning, this morning, if, if you have not prayed the most powerful, the most beautiful, the most miraculous prayer, I want to call you this morning to get to a place where you can make a difference in other people's lives by praying for them. And that is first by praying for yourself. Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. Would you stand with me for just a moment? We're going to sing an old hymn here in just a minute. We're gonna go, we're gonna go retro this morning, and that is this. I'm gonna ask you this morning, by faith, if you're ready to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd love for you by faith, with courage, with with boldness, to step out of your seat and come down and, and just meet me down front here. And and I want to I want to pray with you or have someone here pray with you about Jesus Christ becoming the Lord of your life. You'll know. Today's your day. You'll know. You'll know. So let's sing together. And I invite you to come and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Softly, would you sing aloud this song if you know the words? This is why I 
Jesus calling you this morning to become his child. He becomes your savior and your Lord. Is he calling you today? Listen to what the Spirit's saying inside. Is today your day? Don't wait. Don't worry about what other people are saying. I just want to meet you down front. Let's pray together. Just a moment more and I'll be closing out the service. You come by faith today. You come. Put that foot right out there. Move and let's let's find Jesus together. One more stanza and we're out of here. Let's go. Come on, church, sing that out loud. Oh, what? Amen. Let's, let's close with prayer. Father, thank you that you have given to us prayer. Lord, in the times that we live, more now than ever, prayer is essential. I thank you that the gospels talk. And in it, we find Jesus telling us to pray. Commune with the Father. Get in there and get under his authority and watch Watch what happens. Lord, we just want to see you do things that no man can do through our lives. I thank you that we are a house that prays. Thank you for the many, many, many answers to prayer that we see on a daily basis here at South Bay. May it be so that you would find this house faithful. Jesus, what you said, that your house will be a house of prayer, that's what it's known as today, and that's what it will always be known as as a house of prayer. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and we'll see you Sunday.